Okay, let's start here. How many organizations have a mission statement? According to Jared. It's in your notes. Okay. 98% of most nonprofit faith based organizations have a mission statement. That's important. That's the terminology Jerry used, where you have what you're about with a number of commas that separate the different things that you're trying to accomplish. Vision statement. Should I just tell you? Okay. And this is a good test for me because Jerry will tell me if I'm wrong. 56% have a vision statement. The vision statement is what you hope to accomplish. It's not where the world is now, it's where you want the world to be. And these two are connected, and depending on what school of business you go to, sometimes I've seen those definitions completely flipped and reversed, depending on what textbook you're using. But nonetheless, mission statement, vision statement, how many organizations, based on the surveying that we've done over many, many years, have a strategic plan? Because that's what we're talking about today. Twelve percent. So by the time you leave here this week, and actually after this session over the next several minutes, you're going to have a leg up and have more information and more content and more of a template for decision making and planning than 88 percent of all the organizations that you interact with. How about development plan? Very close, Bill. 3.6. That's, in, in, Bill's, in Bill's terminology for golf, that's a mulligan, right? <laughs> but, but we're here this morning. We're through that process. We're going to show you eight steps. That's a thoughtful planning process you'll be able to go back and use with a planning team to really develop a strategic plan for your organization. So you can go from the 12% to the 88% and hopefully 100% of what you're doing. Let me give you just a quick background on strategic planning. Again, I teach business and in my non-for-profit consulting work, I have a lot of groups come to me, call me on the phone, send me an email and say, we are in the middle of our 2018 strategic plan. 2018 strategic plan. Well, how long will this plan last? Oh, 2018. Oh, okay. So you're talking about your operational annual plan. Oh, no, 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 no. We're talking about our strategic plan. Okay, well, you need some help, so let me come out and let's talk about what that means. Because in the world of business, one, six months to 18 months out usually is considered to be an operational plan. It's really the day to day. This is what we have to do this week, next quarter, maybe the quarter after that, but not too far downstream in terms of time. It's a very close, very close proximity and you're really kind of reacting to, to what's happening in terms of day-to-day -day operations. Kind of the 18 month to maybe three year range is considered to be a tactical plan. You're thinking a little further downfield. You're thinking about your next inventory purchase if you have to plan out for inventory. You're thinking about that next big event that's, the next, that's coming in the next fiscal year, but you're starting to plan for it this year. So that really is how most groups define a tactical plan. Strategic plan is really in the three to five year range. So when a client calls me and says, we're working off of the 2018 strategic plan, I know we have to back up and have a little conversation about what a strategic plan is. So we're thinking, now it doesn't mean your operational plan and tactical plan isn't strategic, it is. But it's attached to this longer view of where we're trying to go, what we're trying to accomplish, and the results we're trying to get with the operations and the organization we're doing. So we're really looking today over the strategic plan three to five years out. Does that make sense? Okay, great. So let's talk about strategic planning a little bit. Lots of ways that people look at planning. I've been in lots of nonprofit organizations, faith-based groups that say, hey, we believe in Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit, we don't really plan, we just kind of go with what the Spirit is asking us to do. I think that's fine, don't get me wrong, that's a good, that's a good model. 
But I also think as leaders of organizations, as we get bigger, as we have more stakeholders involved, we have more partners involved, we have greater impact as we do what God's asked us to do, I think it becomes important for us to take responsibility for where we're going. So we can communicate that story strategically to other people outside the organization and to people within inside the organization. So that's where kind of the strategic planning process comes from. What are some other ways? So if some people don't plan. Sometimes there's this consensus planning. Well, let's all get in a room and talk together and kind of share and kind of see where we are and then make decisions from there. Sometimes it's a very top-down executive director, board chair, uh, the founder of an organization says, this is what we're going to do. This is the planning. Our experience, 90% of strategic plans fail. They don't work. They don't get the organization where they want to be. That's huge. That means 90% of our brothers and sisters working in ministry aren't getting done what they think God wants them to get accomplished. And it's not because they're doing it wrong. It's not because they're living in sin. It's not because any of those reasons. It simply is they haven't put enough energy, emphasis, time, attention, and detail to the strategic plan going out three to five years. So we're going to kind of teach you eight steps on how to get to that level of detail. And it may feel cumbersome at first, but work with us. Trust the process. By the end of the time this morning, you're going to have a really good sense of how you can take this back to your organization, to your ministry, and really work on this. So you're not one of the 90%. Lots of reasons why plans fail. They get created in a vacuum. 2008, when the economy in the United States uh, kind of went south and rippled across the world, I had a number of groups coming to me saying, hey, we just spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money for our board to go off and do a strategic plan, and it is just failing miserably. We are not accomplishing our goals in any way, shape, or form. We need you to come back in, kind of help us figure out, get us back on track, and get us to regroup. The board went off and planned it, didn't involve staff, perhaps, didn't involve key volunteers, perhaps didn't involve other stakeholders who need to be part of that process. Or that directive planning, a single visionary who has their own plan that comes down and kind of from on high says, here's what we're going to do, and what happens? The person that already has 55 hours at work at their desk <laughs> gets this new plan with new ideas, new activities, new things to do, and they don't know what to do with all the rest of it. So sometimes it's, it's in, a, in, a, in a vacuum. I'm just kind of going to take ELF's mission statement. I just pulled it off the website just as an example. I could have used the Habitat for Humanity example that Jerry has already shared with us. I could have taken any of your mission statements. Uh, but I just want to look at how this kind of breaks down. Mission of the European Leadership Forum is to unite, equip, and resource evangelical leaders to renew the biblical church and evangelize Europe. And then they have a whole series of goals. I'm just using that as an example for right now. We'll get, I'm going to place this in another slide a little bit later and kind of show you where this starts to fit in this eight-step planning process, okay? So that's just a contextual piece for right now. Take out a sheet of paper, if you would, please, and write down your organization's mission statement. Or if you have it in a brochure with you, just take it out and circle it. But kind of get your mission statement for your organization, for your ministry, kind of in front of you in black and white or for the ministry that you work with, or one that you volunteer with. Because I want that in front of you, we start to talk about this next step. I think within the, the copy of your PowerPoint slides, you have this slide available, this image. And it really is a thought of a planning team. And it is a team, it's not just you as the ministry head, or you as the development director. It needs to be a team. It needs to have, uh, I think as Lynn mentioned, from folks across the organization, and maybe even outside the organization. Maybe you have some suppliers who are, are big stakeholders in terms of what value they provide your organization. They may need to be a part of that as well. So just realize we're talking about a planning team here, not someone working in a vacuum, not just one person off in the closet trying to think what is most important for a mission or organization. It's broken into two different legs. This mission planning leg is really attached to your mission statement, which is why I asked you to write that down. So you know that in the mission planning, you have one, two, or three, or maybe four different clauses in your mission statement that you have to achieve. That's part of what you do. It's your purpose for being as a ministry. So you look at that and say, okay, so we have two or three clauses, um, and that'll be the commas. The commas, sure, sure. This is a different phrase to talk about what you do. Okay. 
So you're going to look at that. So we're going to have one section of planning that just looked at your mission statement and how to make sure we can quantify what we say we're about. Let me take Jerry's example of Bill Bright uh, and his challenge. It was both a vision and a mission at the same time when he said, I want us to reach 4.2 million people or billion people by the year 2000 with the Jesus film. Now, he's casting vision. He's also setting the strategic plan because you know exactly what they want to have happen. 4.2 billion people in roughly 22 years at that point. So that was the goal. That was the plan. You knew when they were going to get there, right? Then over here, these five critical areas, these may not be the exact areas that you look at, but they're things that are mission critical, things that you have to have in place in order to accomplish your mission statement. This happens to be set up more or less for a Christian school in the States. So don't get too hung up by some of these categories. So facilities, curriculum, extracurricular, personnel, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to take this now and try to kind of transpose this into the ELF situation. And I did not consult with ELF. I don't think they'd get mad at me, but this is just how I interpreted kind of how they work off their mission statement. So we're back here again, mission planning, specifically connected to your mission statement. So they want to unite, equip, and resource. So we're going to have some people on our planning team work just on those three. How do we know when we've united? How do we know when we've equipped? How do we know when we've resourced? Time dated, specific, quantifiable goals. We'll get to that in a second with some of the steps. So I just said, one might be venue for ELF, the hotel they use for the forum every year. So some, there's some planning that goes along with that in terms of budget, in terms of time. How many rooms do we have? How many conference rooms do we have? What sort of AV uh, equipment do they have for plenary sessions? What kind of food resources do they have, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just making that up. One might be the venue. One might be the networks that we're a part. We're one of those, right? What about all the other networks? So that could be another issue that, or another uh, planning piece that ELF has to think about to make sure they can actually have the right networks in place, the right facilitator for the network, the right mentors in place, that sort of thing. And then um, yearly, um, year-round mentoring, volunteers, and focal. And again, I just kind of randomly did those for the sake of having an example for you to look at. Okay? So if you've got your organization and your mission, what are the five critical areas that you have to work on that are important for your ministry to accomplish what God has asked you to accomplish. Pregnancy Resource Center. My wife worked on it for three years in the States. A lot of pregnancy resource centers now have an ultrasound machine. So when a young girl comes in, she, might, she thinks she's pregnant, she's not sure, they can ultrasound and really show, yes, there's actually a human being inside of you. And depending on whose report you listen to or, and read, there can be as much as an 80 to 90 to a 95% chance that young woman will decide to carry that baby to term once they see that child and once they see that heartbeat and hear the heartbeat in that ultrasound. So it's a huge piece for U.S.-based pregnancy care centers. So they may have one of these that really is focused on ultrasound machine or medical services. So again, depending on your ministry, it may be three of these, maybe five of these, you may have six of those, but whatever they are specific that's important for you to have in place to accomplish your mission. Okay. So let's talk about the eight steps. And I'm going to step these pretty quickly. Actually, they're on pages 21, 22 in your little black book um, that I think many of you have. You can refer to that if you like to. We'll just step through it pretty quick. And it's not rocket science. I mean, nothing Jerry and I bring to you this week is rocket science, but I think it's organized in a way that helps you kind of get your arms around how to take this back to your organization. So let's look at the first one. You want to profile the ideal situation, the ideal outcome for that particular element. So let's back up to ELF for just a second. So someone in ELF's planning team needs to determine what is the ideal when we think of Unite. If we could unite everybody that wanted to unite, what would it look like? How many people would that be? When could we get that to happen? So they have to, to put some kind of quantifiable pieces to that. Otherwise, the strategic plan is simply a wish list. Oh, we kind of want Europeans to be really on fire for Jesus and doing really good things. And that in and of itself was not bad. But unless we have some quantifiable pieces to it, how do we know? I like Andy Stanley's terminology. In some of his leadership podcasts, he talks about clarify the win. How do you know when you've scored the goal? How do you know when you've accomplished your goal? It has to be time 
uh, tested, has to have a date on it, and has to have some sort of numerical piece, either percentage, per, um, and total number of people, something that talks about how do we know when we've united. And until we unite, we still haven't accomplished our entire mission as ELF. Same thing with your organization. Is that, is that making sense? Okay. So we're going to come up with the idea. We're going to profile all of those elements. The mission critical pieces on the right-hand side of that chart, as well as the, um, the mission pieces on the left side of the chart. So the ideal, what does that look like? How do we know? Then you're going to assess it. We use a simple A, B, C, D, and that's very US-centric. And I won't apologize for that, but it may not work for you, because that's attached to our educational system, and students get an A, a B, a C, or a D, or even worse, depending on how, how they work in the class. So if that feels too US-centric for you, use a one, two, three, and four. Use um, red, green, yellow, and orange. Use something else that works for you and for your ministry planning team uh, if this feels a little bit too US-connected uh, to you. So you're just going to assess it. Where are we now? So in the ELF description, if we're about uniting evangelicals on the continent, then are we at a B, are we at a C, are we at an A? Where are we now in, our, in the progress of our mission? Okay. You're just, you're, just, you're just putting a label on it. Where are we as we stand right now? Then as a team, Again, not just one person, but as a team, you're going to get together and talk about why you gave the grade that you did for that element. So for Unite, if there's a team of ELF people in the room and they're working on, you know, how did this, how do we do a uniting people around this year's forum, they're going to say, well, I think it went pretty well and I gave it a C uh, or I gave it a B and someone else said, well, I gave it an A because whatever. But you want to kind of list out all the reasons that you gave that grade. And because you have different people in the room, because they have different roles in the mission or the organization, they have a different prism they're looking through, they probably gave it different grades. And that's okay, because you're gonna wanna talk about the reasons you gave that grade, or the reason you gave it that score, or kind of put it at that, at that label. Does that make sense? So I know sometimes I'll go to a big event and someone says, oh, this is just the best banquet we ever had and the speaker was wonderful and we raised all the money that we wanted and this is just, this was an A plus event. And maybe I was in charge of the event. And I know all the things that went on behind the scenes that nobody else saw that drove me crazy and caused me to have gray hair and pull my hair out and the caterer was late and the speaker was a prima donna and I'd never worked with that person again and the church that we were holding it in didn't get the doors unlocked in time so we were rushing around to try to get the table set up. I may have given it a C minus. But the board member I'm talking, across, I'm talking to gave it an A plus. So this is where you start to describe amongst your team Okay, why did you give it the grade that you gave? And let's talk about the reasons for that. Now, it's okay to have different grades, but let's make sure we know why we gave the grade that we did. Then you're going to prioritize. Okay, we found some deficiencies. We have some things that are a C, or we have some things that are a D. How do we go about fixing those? How do we determine which of those are most important to fix? Let me give you an example. Uh, this is a little micro example, but I think it'll work, work okay. Christian school has a large gymnasium for volleyball and for basketball. And it's the beginning of the basketball season and about half of the lights in the gym are burned out. So it's kind of half in darkness and the kids are playing half dark. And someone's like, gosh, we gotta, we, you know, that, we give it a C. Do we have any light bulbs? We need to make sure we get some light bulbs and put lights in it before the, the basketball season starts. And then it rains really hard from the south one night. And everybody comes in the next morning and there's water on the basketball floor because there's a hole in the roof. What happens many times in problem solving and decision making is the problem that is easiest to fix, least expensive to fix, and fastest to fix is the one that gets fixed. It may not be the most important issue to fix. In this case, the roof is probably the most important issue to fix. If you don't fix that, have more water on the, on the floor, it's going to ruin the wood tiles. doesn't matter if you're in the dark or not. <laughs> you still can't play basketball. But the, the very nature of how we work usually is, let's fix a quick thing first. Put new light bulbs in. So it helps you prioritize. And again, this may not be just in the basketball court. It may be across the organization as you start to kind of evaluate where the different elements and different areas are. They're going to plan for how you're going to fix that, how you're going to build up that deficit, that piece that's kind of a little short. You kind of get it from a C to a B or from B to an A. So within budget constraints, 
within the categories. Those categories are what? The three or four items on your mission statement and those three to four to five critical areas on the right hand side of that schematic that really talk about how do we really plan for this and kind of phase in what the issue is. So this might be starting to take, take resources from other areas of the organization, say the teacher retreat that was gonna happen in the basketball court on the upcoming weekend, they now have to move because guess what? We can't use the basketball court anymore because there's a hole in the roof. So that may bump some other things, either part of your mission critical areas, probably not something in your mission statement, but certainly those mission critical areas in terms of now we have to kind of phase in how we get this fixed based on what we have. Hopefully, the school has some reserves set aside. Maybe it's an insurance thing that could fix the roof. We don't know that for sure because this is a completely, bless you, completely fictitious situation. But someone's gonna have to say, we have to come up with the resources and to be able to make sure that we can fix the roof. Otherwise, the floor gets even more ruined. We start losing tiles there. Maybe structural damage to the roof that becomes an unsafe building that we can't use any longer. You know, organize. Organize to get the roof fixed. Okay, first thing, we have to get someone to come up on the roof, put a piece of board down, put a tarp over it so we don't get any more water in in case it continues to rain tonight. And then someone's got to mop up the floor that's on the, the, the water that's on the floor, the wood tile of the gymnasium floor now. Then we have to make sure that someone calls um, uh, the contractor in the morning to come get an estimate and really assess how much damage is there and how much is it really going to cost, how long will it take them to fix it, et cetera, et cetera. Just kind of or coordinate those resources you have available. Money, people, volunteers, contractors, other people that can help get that job done. And again, kind of a micro problem, but I think it works for our, our discussion. Then implement. Okay, tomorrow the custodian or the head of uh, facilities is going to call uh, a couple of contractors, get some estimates. We expect to have estimates back in a couple of days and figure out when they can start to schedule it. In the meantime, we had three events planned in the gymnasium. We have to move those someplace to an auditorium or to another building, uh, to another classroom. So all this kind of orchestration has to happen as you again try to fix this issue that we've decided was a C or a D. We've quantified why it was a C or a D. Well, there's water coming in and they start to work down. So that really is kind of the reason you start to go through those steps individually. I see a lot of groups kind of do this prioritize, plan, organize all in one fell swoop, and they kind of miss some steps because you really haven't thought through very specifically what kind of implications that has. And then guess what? It's an ongoing process. Now, in the roof situation, again, it's a little bit too small perhaps for, the, for this best discussion, but we're looking at, okay, the roof is fixed. We've got some light bulbs, we replaced it. We go back and evaluate, we went from a C or a D to an A, because now the gym's usable again, and operational again. In the bigger picture of your strategic plan on a regular basis, might be quarterly, might be every six months, you want your planning team to go back and start to check out all those different elements, the, the mission specific pieces, at your mission statement, and the other pieces on the right side of the schematic that's not here, that talk about, um, the things that are important to you, the facilities, your staff, uh, your programs, whatever that is, this is an ongoing process. My whole life is in big interlocking circles. It's all connected at some level, like the Olympic rings. It's never in a straight line the way that PowerPoint portrays it. So this is really how I kind of view this. So every three months, every six months, every four months, this planning team needs to get back together formally or informally and really talk about the profile assess, quantify, prioritize, plan, organize, implement, and evaluate all over again. It's a cycle that needs to happen. Otherwise, you kind of get stuck. Oh, we, got the, we got the strategic plan done, isn't that great? A year later, someone comes back and says, well, how's the strategic plan going? Well, I don't know, it's up here on the shelf. We haven't looked at it since. And that happens a lot, at least in the, the clients that I work with. Okay, you're looking at me. Some of you need some more coffee. I understand that, or more tea. Why so much detail? This just really feels cumbersome, Greg. I understand why you're going to such level of detail. Let me give you a story. I'm going to steal a story from Jerry. Jerry has better stories than I have, so I'm going to steal one of his. Christian School in North Carolina in the States, probably one of the premier educational administrators in, in Christian education in the States, was working on a big plan, a strategic plan for their school. 
And they had actually gone, done all the due diligence, all the hard work, all the time and attention to make sure they had a very detailed plan. And they actually had a 15 year plan that involved new buildings, new facilities, new equipment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was built in three phases. $20 million over 15 years was kind of what they did. And they did their, they did their hard work. They really got down kind of in the middle and into the weeds, as we say in the States, and really tried to come up with the detail they needed for their strategic plan. They're in phase one of the three phases. Total three phases, $20 million, 15 years. Phase one was $7.5 million. They had about $5 million raised. And they're going through the development model that we've been talking about for this. So they had their affinity groups, they had their nuclear prospects, they had their fringe folks, and they're down to their fringe folks. And there's not much money coming in. They've run out of people to talk to. They're going to be short by $2.5 million. What are we going to do? And I forget the exact story, but Sam, I'm a father in the school, got connected to the administrator. And the father came in, and nobody really knew much about him. He was a businessman. He traveled quite a bit. He had kids in the school, but no one knew much about what he did or, or, or what he was about. So the administrator's meeting with this, with this uh, father, and the father says, well, kind of show me your plan. The administrator says, well, sure. And he grabs the, the blueprints and grabs the plans and spreads them out in front of him. He says, this is phase one of a three-phase project, and we need $7.5 million, and we have $5 million. We're looking for you know, some additional help to really kind of finish this up so we can do the entire phase one. Otherwise, we'll have to cut back on some things. And the guy kind of looks at it. So this is really good. you got this kind of new set of classrooms here. That's really cool. I see you've redone the parking lot, so it's safer for student drivers to get in and out of. That's really great on the main street. Um, so what's, what's phase two look like? And the administrator goes, phase two? What do you mean phase two? I want you to, I want you to fund, help us fund phase one. I'm still on phase one over here. And the father says, so what, show me the rest of the plan. So he turns the page and there's phase two. And it's several years down the road and several additional million dollars. And the father's looking at this. He says, oh, I see you're going to do like a, a whole new um, set of, of fields for soccer and for, uh, for uh, excuse me, football, right? Football. Yeah, I'm sorry. Football. Yes, football. Yeah. Good, good catch, huh? Yeah. Got to remember where I am. Football and softball and whatever sorts of outdoor games that they do. And maybe there's a new building over here where it's going to be a, a dedicated teacher and faculty lab and a resource center that they're going to use. So the father says, this is really great. This is really cool. We really need this. We really need to do this. Headmaster's like, well, well, yeah, but what I need is for phase one. So the father says, well, what else you got? What else? What's the rest of the plan? So the administrator turns the page, and there's phase three, and it's additional million dollars, additional time. Remember, twenty million dollars over fifteen years was the plan that they developed. And so uh, you have a, an, an arts building, an auditorium for, for plays and for um, music pieces and for creative arts to go on. And here you've got a whole other building of classrooms you're going to do. That's really great. Expand the capacity to the school. And the father says, this is really great. We've got to do this. And Mr. Ray says, well, yeah, we need to do this. And I need $2.5 million <laughs> over here to finish phase one. He says, yeah, we're really hoping to accomplish this, you know, $20 million in 15 years. And the father says, no, 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 no. You don't understand. We need to do this. Yeah. No, we need to do this now. And the minister is kind of scratching his head. He doesn't know where to go with the conversation. Barely knows this individual. I'm going to give you a check for $20 million. This needs to get done now. My heart is moved by what you've done, the vision you have for students in this community. I'm going to give you a check for $20 million. Whole thing right now. Let's not wait 15 years. Administrators like, how to even say yes and thank you to that, right? All you can do is say thank you and kind of walk out with your jaw down. So phenomenal piece of God working because guess what? He moved the heart of the gentleman, obviously, but the school had done their homework, no pun intended. They had built the plan so they knew where they wanted to go. They had the time, they had the dates, they had the dollars, they had the, the numbers put in place so someone could look at that and say $20 million, 15 years. Turn it to $20 million in like 15 minutes. Now, other part of that story, which is really cool, and it just shows you how God is, is just so cool. Maybe it was like a week later, I think. So the headmaster, obviously, is just ecstatic. He cashes the check, uh, excuse me, deposits the check, and they're off on their way. And like a week later, he bumps into this gentleman again at a school event, and you know, he can't say thank you enough times in enough ways to someone who just gave you $20 million. Um, of course, we should say that same way, be thank that thankful for the widow's might from some other family, but obviously 
$20 million, you're going to be pretty effusive in your thanks and gratitude. And the gentleman said, the father says, oh, no, 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 don't worry about that. Because a few days after I gave you the $20 million, God restored that $20 million to me through a business transaction. So God gave it all back to me. So you cannot give God. There's one parable of that story. But that conversation would never have happened if the school hadn't had the strategic plan. They could have said, oh, we want to teach kids about the worldview that Jesus has and make sure they're prepared for the, for the secular world when they leave our K-12 academy. That's a really cool tagline or, or slogan, but it doesn't get the planning done that allows someone to say, I know where you're going, I know how you're going to clarify the win, I know when you're going to be there and be able to contribute and be a partner with you, come alongside and be part of what it is that you do. So that's why we talk about so much detail. But you're doing it on a team, so it's okay. You have a group of people helping you do that as you move forward. Okay. Let me give you a little bonus to help you go back as you start to plan and start to work through this when you get home. The, these eight steps don't just fit strategic planning. They're very important for strategic planning, but they will really fit virtually any project, any task, any activity, any program that your ministry is about. So I can take that banquet example and I can say, okay, we're going to do this eight, this eight uh, step planning process for the annual banquet that we do. What's the ideal? How do we know that we've had a great successful banquet? Then let's give it a grade. How do we do this year? And again, I gave the example, the board member thought it was an A plus, I thought it was a C minus because we sat in different chairs. Then let's figure out why, why we had different reasons for, the, for those grades, or, or grades for different reasons. So any kind of example that you have, you can use these eight steps as a way to evaluate and then plan again, because again, it's a cycle, plan again that next project or the next mailing or the next activity or the next campaign. So as you go back to your ministries, maybe instead of launching this giant strategic planning opportunity, uh, that involves a lot of people, maybe start to introduce this with your staff or volunteers on kind of a very small basis. We're going to evaluate one project and then plan it again using these eight steps in the cycle. Does that make sense? Kind of manageable bites, manageable, manageable pieces. Jerry's term was slice and dice. So take a smaller piece. So you can say, okay, our next project um, is an outreach for backyard Bible clubs. We're going to use these eight steps as we start to frame, picture ideal, how do we know we've won, and then use that cycle again uh, to make sure we can evaluate it and do it better next time. So the grade goes up, so our assessment goes up. So we're closing to reaching our ideal, both as mission as well as the specific components.